Australia's obsession with every new COVID infection that's recorded here is turning us into a nation of neurotics. It's a bastard of a virus, but surely it doesn't have to dominate every waking moment of our lives. Getting the country vaccinated will ease the pain, but more immediately, so might looking overseas. In other parts of the world, despite the highly transmissible Delta strain running rampant, restrictions are being lifted and life is beginning to look like normal. Of course, without full herd immunity, those nations are taking enormous gambles and there are many who vehemently oppose the strategy. But for the sake of our sanity, is it something that we should consider? If there's a sign of Britain's defiance of COVID, it's here at Wimbledon. Capacity crowds are back again euphorically embracing the tennis and the joys of an English summer. This is absolutely primo. In amongst the throng is James Contos, an Australian who's lived in London for the past five years. There's definitely a party atmosphere. I can, I can speak amongst kind of people my age, I'm 32, kind of people in their 20s and 30s. There's, there's definitely a lot of excitement, a lot of kind of built up pressure um, from the last 18 months. And there's more to come, you know, people booking holidays, booking festivals, um, throwing parties, out and about all the time. So it, it should be a pretty good summer. With his mates by his side, it's a little like emerging from a mass hibernation. This is the first big event James has been to after 18 long months dominated by pandemic-imposed isolation. You're really making up for lost time, aren't you? Yeah, 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 absolutely. People have been locked in their houses and they're not anymore and it's summertime and people are vaccinated and I think the country feels like it paid a massive, massive price to earn this freedom and to earn this right to go and have a great time. A year ago, Wimbledon didn't even happen. Cancelled for the first time since World War II. Britain was in the dismal depths of lockdown. Its handling of the pandemic, a complete and utter disaster. Thank you. My name is Michael Kane. I've just had a vaccine for COVID. It didn't hurt. Not many people know that. Star power was barely needed to persuade people to take the vaccine. The brutal toll of the pandemic was incentive enough. And now the country is ripping off the Band-Aid and reopening fully. Confident it's immune to the worst of the virus even though infections are skyrocketing. Case numbers over there are soaring at the moment. Why is there no panic? The vaccine. The vaccine. And I think the price we paid was the reason there was so much urgency behind the, um, the vaccine program and maybe why Australia didn't quite have the same urgency as us because um, they, you know, over there, the people got through relatively scot-free and then maybe to a degree paying for it a little bit now. Are you proud of where your country's at at the moment? I'm very proud that we've been able to develop the vaccine and use it along with other vaccines. And it was always about having as many vaccines available as possible. It's very good that we've been able to get a high vaccination rate and now we can look to, to moving on to the next phase. Leaders who have developed the anti-COVID vaccines... A couple of weeks ago, the Wimbledon crowd showed vaccine pioneer Dame Sarah Gilbert its appreciation with a standing ovation that went viral around the world. Well, the rise on centre court, one of the biggest cheers you'll ever hear in this sporting stadium. The scientist responsible for AstraZeneca humbled by this spontaneous display of support. Well, that was really unexpected. I thought I was just going to go there and watch some tennis and, uh, and be quietly in the background. But it was great to have that reception for, on behalf of everybody who's worked on the vaccine. So really great to have that recognition. Does it really sink in at a moment like that, how much your work means to, to so many people? I, yeah, I suppose it does. I suppose it does. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge team effort. We need to remember that all the time, uh, that, you know, we all work together on this and really pleased now to see it being widely used. With 86% of adults in the UK having had at least one jab, on Tuesday, Prime Minister Boris Johnson took a big step towards what may or may not be the end game. We must be honest with ourselves that if we can't reopen our society in the next few weeks, when will we be able to return to normal? 
On July the 19th, most of the remaining COVID restrictions will be torn up on what's been dubbed Freedom Day. Our vaccines have helped to break the link between disease and death. Do you get a thrill seeing life starting to come back to normal? Everybody would be really pleased to see life come back to normal. I think we've got some way to go yet. We're not moving into a post-COVID world yet. In the UK, we're moving into a post-restrictions world with the new announcements that restrictions are going to be lifted quite soon. But we know there's going to be a lot of this virus around. In fact, case numbers are going up quite sharply at the moment. And we're seeing very low rates going into hospital now, but not zero. So it's moving into the next phase. We're not completely going back to normal yet. Britain's now decided it can coexist with COVID comfortably enough. But that's a risky state of mind when the dangerous Delta variant is rampaging through its population. What do you think when, when you see crowds at Wimbledon and, and full stadiums at the Euros? It's worrisome. I think having a fanciful dream that the Delta variant is over once we release our lockdowns and see cases fall is a complete pipe dream. World-renowned epidemiologist Dr Eric Feigl-Ding is far from alone in being deeply pessimistic about Britain's jump into the unknown. The Delta variant really is a game changer, isn't it? Yeah, the Delta variant is not like any variant we've seen. It is leaps and bounds faster in transmissibility, more contagious than any variant known to date. This is why Delta variant is the greatest scourge um, that we've faced so far in the pandemic to date. The Delta variant first emerged in India last October, wreaking havoc before spreading across the globe. A mutated version of COVID, twice as transmissible as the original, it's now reached almost 100 countries. Since its arrival in Britain, it's rapidly become the dominant strain, responsible for 90% of all infections. To Eric Fagel Ding, allowing it to run free is a terrible blunder. If we let the virus spread in the population, it will infect a lot of people, it will sicken a lot of people, it will kill a lot of people, and it will give long COVID to a lot of people. There is still lots of room for the virus to mutate. We want to stop transmission, stop the opportunistic uh, chances for it to develop a mutation. Daily cases in the UK are now more than 30,000, with new infections expected to surge well beyond 100,000 per day in just a few weeks' time. For the unvaccinated, Delta is just as dangerous as previous strains, perhaps even more so. But here's what British decision makers say is now the important measuring stick. The rates of hospitalisations and deaths are relatively low. It's only early days, but it appears the vaccine is doing its job. When you see case numbers soaring like they are in the UK at the moment, do, do you then worry about society reopening fully as is expected on July 19? It's a very difficult decision to be made about uh, when to start lifting the restrictions. The concern is if it's pushed late, uh, we'll actually end up in a situation where we've just delayed the rise in cases until winter when flu may be circulating as well. And we know that flu and COVID together is really, really bad news. So uh, trying to balance all of those different options, the decision has been made to, to lift restrictions in July. But I think we have to keep a very close eye on what's happening. And if we see more people starting to go into hospital, maybe think again about some of these measures. What happens in Britain is a look into a future when we too have a highly vaccinated population and start to open up our borders. But there's no doubt it's one almighty gamble. London at the moment is a bit of a lab rat for the world. Yeah, it feels like, it, it feels like a petri dish for sure. And I can see from international newspapers that the world is watching. Um, it, it's, it's, it's been called the Great Gamble. It hadn't struck me, but we are the first place in the world to um, continue opening up in the face of insane case numbers. Um, but again, we're, we're also fairly unique in the world in how well vaccinated the population is. So I, I do see why it's kind of being seen as an experiment um, and it's, it's really, really seems to be the vaccine and the virus going head to head. So uh, yeah, very interesting times. Who's going to win? I hope the vaccine. It is hope, though, isn't it? That, that no one really knows. No one really knows. 
But we've learned over the last 18 months, COVID doesn't quit. And now the fear is variants even more dangerous than Delta could be on the way. It is incredibly contagious and evasive because we have given it the playground to learn how to adapt to our bodies. It is not over. We cannot rest and let up because the virus will learn to adapt and evolve an even more evasive, more faster contagious version. In Israel, they've reached the promised land when it comes to COVID-19, getting enough of the population vaccinated to fully open up again. Summer on the shores of the sun-soaked Mediterranean Sea is the reward after this country became the testing ground of sorts for the Pfizer vaccine. You know, the coffee shops are full and the restaurants are full and everybody, the, the beaches are full and everybody's outside and everything is uh, back to normal, you know. Everything is uh, regular. Moti Galam is one of the locals kicking back and enjoying this new normality. Israel is one of the most vaccinated countries on earth, with more than 60% of the total population having had both jabs. COVID was beginning to feel like a thing of the past, but then Delta dawned. What's the COVID situation in Israel at the moment? Now it's like, uh, um, it's like coming back, you know? We had a war and we changed the government, so the COVID uh, wasn't on the news. And now in the uh, last uh, three weeks, it's like coming back. Is it fair to say most people thought COVID was just something they didn't have to worry about anymore? Uh, we thought so. <laughs> we, we took off the masks and we thought that, uh, yeah, the COVID is, uh, you know, history. But uh, it's not. Motti knows this as well as anyone. The 57-year-old contracted COVID despite having both doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Were you shocked? Yes. <laughs> yes. I was in shock. I was disappointed because I thought that I never get it. I have, I have the vaccine. So the COVID is, uh, you know, it, come, it, it can't come to my house. And uh, it came big time. I mean, three of us uh, got sick. Motti's experience proves two things. You can still catch COVID once you're vaccinated, but in good news, your symptoms are likely to be very mild. It's exactly like a flu. You have like two, three days that you want to go to bed, to rest, you have no energy, but that's all. I mean, I didn't have any breathing problems. I think if, uh, God forbid, if uh, people will go into hospital and have some problems as in the beginning of the COVID, before the vaccine, that uh, will be a problem. But for now, I think it's okay. Israel has seen a spike in case numbers, but just like in the UK, they haven't translated to a surge in hospitalizations. Epidemiologist Eric Feigl-Ding sees that as the one silver lining in the battle against Delta. The good news is that the vaccines do work against the Delta variant. It works pretty well, 94% efficacy against hospitalization. That is good but it is not a bulletproof vest against you carrying the virus and you spreading it to others. And I think that is the problem. The common perception is that once enough people get vaccinated, that's how we beat the virus. But, but what have we learnt from Israel that does have a, a comparatively really high rate of vaccination? Although they're 60% vaccinated, guess what? The rest of the 40% that are not fully vaccinated are still spreading the virus and it's leaking through part of the vaccinated population to those people as well. Having the Delta variant spread in your community brings another risk. It poses a much greater threat to children. So much so that the race is now on in Israel to vaccinate kids between the ages of 12 and 16. Today, it's the turn of 14-year-old Liam Rosenfeld for his first Pfizer jab. It was okay. I'm glad to have it. I feel more uh, protected from COVID. It uh, was okay. 
More than 100,000 teens have now been vaccinated in Israel as the Delta variant runs rampant through schools. I think it's like uh, the COVID is here to stay. You know what I'm saying? It's not, uh, we, we thought that it's going to disappear, but it's not. I think it's here to stay and we have to learn to live with it. In the new normal, COVID-19 will not dominate our lives. To keep our people safe while reopening progressively, we have to test, we have to trace, we have to vaccinate. To everyone in Singapore, thank you for playing your part. In Singapore, 40% of the population is now fully vaccinated. It too is looking to ease restrictions. It hopes by the end of the year. So you really do feel like this is the final chapter? Uh, well, we've been waiting for a vaccine, right? And now we've got the vaccine and now it's, it's been implemented. So uh, the vaccine was supposed to lead us out of this pandemic. So we're not waiting for anything else. Professor Dale Fisher is a senior member of the World Health Organisation based in Singapore. Despite new Delta outbreaks, Singapore is for now unfazed, saying being spooked by case numbers alone is a very 2020 way of approaching this situation. Because what you're seeing is the number of cases increase, but not the number of hospitalisations and deaths. So it, it's a different game. So this is why Singapore is, is talking about stopping counting the cases eventually, because that will be the future. We don't count the number of common cold cases every year, or there's another, another 10,000 cases of the cold this month. No, we, that, that's, that's pointless because it's, it's not a severe illness. Does there come a time when everyone has had the chance to be fully vaccinated that those who, who don't take it up, that the government just says, tough luck, you had your chance, we're reopening? Yeah, look, I, I think there'll come a time when we have to say to people, you either have the COVID-19 vaccine or you get COVID because it's going to be circulating without all the measures that we've had in place. There is one other lesson they've learned in Singapore that Dale believes Australia should be wary of. Contact tracing becomes more difficult the more people are vaccinated. One of the interesting features of Delta, which is a highly transmissible variant of, of COVID-19, is that when this is in a vaccinated or partially vaccinated community, it's much harder to track because there's so many people with mild or asymptomatic disease, if 40% if of your population is vaccinated, that you can get spread from asymptomatic to asymptomatic and then, then maybe a case will appear sort of in the next suburb and, and people will wonder how did it get there. But I think this is a, a twist we didn't really expect. So what happens at that point? Because I'd imagine there will be a lot of vaccinated people who contract the virus, are asymptomatic. How are we going to know who's then spreading it from person to person to person? Well, you won't. You can either do incredible mass testing, as we see in China, you know, literally hundreds of thousands or millions of people getting tested, or you live with it. What we've learned throughout this pandemic is that this is a virus that's constantly evolving. Dame Sarah Gilbert and her team at Oxford University managed to cram what normally takes 10 years into 10 months when they created the AstraZeneca vaccine. The challenge for them now is making sure their vaccine still does the job against whatever mutations of COVID come next. That is a concern. Uh, as long as the virus continues to circulate between people, there's always a possibility new mutations will arise and be selected and that we'll have something even more difficult to deal with. Um, the, the nightmare scenario is a new variant that the vaccine has much lesser effect against. So we need to get the vaccine used really widely around the whole world and stop transmission everywhere. Because if a new mutant arises that escapes vaccine immunity in one part of the world, it will travel and get to the rest of us. As the rest of the world opens up, the bad news for Australia, of course, is that we are woefully under-vaccinated. If we chose to live with this while the rates of vaccination is at 9%, we will see thousands and thousands of hospitalisations and death. Part of the problem has been our reluctance to get the jab. An aversion to risk has come back to bite us. In Britain, people are so thankful for the AstraZeneca vaccine 
Yet here in Australia, it's become a political football as leaders bicker over its use and safety, undermining public confidence. I don't want an 18 year old in Queensland dying from a clotting um, illness who, if they got COVID, probably wouldn't die. Are you somewhat disheartened by, I guess, the, the, the demonisation of the AstraZeneca vaccine in some parts of Australia? Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with exactly what's going on in Australia, but I think what we're trying to do is, is just be honest about what the situation really is. Um, it's a highly effective vaccine. I've been vaccinated with it, as have many of my colleagues and my family, and very happy to be so. And I meet many people in the UK who come and tell me that they're so pleased to have had the vaccine. There is, is nothing that you can do and that won't have some risk associated with it, and sometimes not doing something has risk associated with it as well. For now in Australia, it's a battle to keep the case numbers and variants at bay until our vaccine rollout catches up to our foreign counterparts. Do you look forward and see a finish line? Oh yeah, this pandemic will end, but that ending will be different in different countries. Uh, Singapore believes it'll be uh, at that point before the end of the year. COVID-19 will be a severe disease potentially in unvaccinated people, but when you've got a community that's largely vaccinated, you're going to see the cases coming up again, but you're not going to see the hospitalisations and deaths. So this is what the new normal looks like. While parts of Australia are currently in lockdown, the tables are turned in the UK. A packed house at Wembley on Thursday showing how far other countries have come. We are no longer the envy of the world. James Contos, an Aussie living in London, was among the excitement, making the most of his newfound freedom. He's hoping in this battle of the vaccine versus the virus, it's his team that comes out on top. Australia was streets ahead of the UK there for, for such a long time, but do you feel like the UK is now closer to the finish line? Uh, I would have to say yes, because um, at this stage we've got you know 95% or, or higher of, of highly vulnerable people uh, vaccinated. Uh, everyone who's not been vaccinated either doesn't want to be or, or can't be. And I think the, the thinking is if we don't open now, when are we going to reopen? And, and if not now, then what are we actually waiting for? Hello, I'm Tom Steinford. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au as well as the 9now app.